All right, well, good morning, everyone. Today we are in Ruth chapter 2, and we are continuing our series entitled God Sees You. And I thought that that would be a good title for the study because throughout this whole book, the book of Ruth, we see a whole host of individuals that just like us today would have reason to wrestle with that question. Does God really see me? You see, it's easy to say that God loves the world. He sent his only son to die for the world. It's easy to say that God loves his church. Now, that's his bride, but it's an entirely different question to say and then actually to believe that God loves me personally, individually, as a person. And so does God really see me? Does he see the situation that I'm going through? Does he see the circumstance, the hardship that I am facing, the suffering and the pain and the grief that I am feeling? That is what's going on in the book of Ruth. And from our perspective, we can see that the answer to that question is an emphatic yes. In chapter one, we see an entire nation of people, uh, Israel, uh, experiencing a famine in the land of Israel, probably due to their sin. Remember, this is the time of the judges, very dark time in Israel's history talked about that last week, how during the time of the judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They had no basis for morality. They just did whatever they wanted to. And so it was a very dark time in Israel's history. And so the famine that came through here and that caused this family to leave Bethlehem and to leave Israel and to go to another land probably was sent by the Lord in judgment as a discipline for the nation of Israel. But God, during this time, as the nation of Israel, they would, they would sin. God would allow nations to take over, to oppress them, uh, to hurt them, and then they would cry out. God would have pity on them, and then God would raise up a judge. He would raise up somebody to go in and to restore them and to bring them back. But what we see throughout the book of Ruth is that God was not just using the judges, God was not just using the popular kids. You see, it's, it's easy, even in our day, we can relate this this way, that there are big names in the Christian faith that we hear about, that we know. John MacArthur, Beth Moore, David Platt, Francis Chan, like the big names. They write all these books. They do all these sermons. They do all these wonderful things that we see all the time. Those are like giants to us. And yet what we have to realize is that as we read the book of Ruth, God does not just use the popular kids. God does not just use the judges during this time. God uses ordinary people like you and me all of the time. Because here we see that in the midst of this famine, this is an ordinary fa family. They are not mentioned before this point. Where did they come from? They're, they're Israelis. They're part of the Israelite nation, but they're just an ordinary family. According to a human perspective, there's really no significance to this family. They are from the town of Bethlehem, which we know of as very significant because that's where our Lord came from. But at this time in the book of Ruth, Bethlehem was nothing. It was just a very small town, insignificant in the eyes of mankind. The prophecy that Micah 5, 2 gives about from you, O Bethlehem, you're, you, even though you're the smallest of the clans of Israel, like from you, a ruler will come forth. That had not been given for almost a thousand years. So at this point, it was still an insignificant town. And so what we see is an ordinary family, husband and wife, two kids. They pack their bags and they leave an insignificant, ordinary town, and they head out of Israel into a land of idolatry in order to find sustenance. And after living in that land, the land of Moab for a time, Naomi's husband dies. They were leaving the land of Israel in order to escape death, and yet death is exactly what found them. And so her husband dies, and her two sons end up marrying daughters of Moab, foreign women who are, idolatry, who are idol worshipers. And then, out of nowhere, out of the blue, her two sons died. And even though she grew to love these girls over time, you can imagine that with the pain and the grief that she was feeling, she would have thought at least once, my life was not supposed to turn out this way. God, how could you allow this to happen to me? This pain, this suffering, how can you allow me to experience all of this grief and all of this sorrow? And so that is where Naomi was at. Her life was a mess, and from her perspective, it was over. It was ruined. There, there was no hope from her, for her, from her perspective. But what about you and I? Have you ever been in a place like Naomi was? 
in a pit of despair, thinking that all hope was lost. Like, have you ever suffered so much that you've, you've even said in a prayer, God, I know what your word says. Your word from beginning to end says that you were involved in my life. Your word from beginning to end says that you love me, that you see me, that you hear me, that you know me personally. And yet I don't understand what you're doing. I don't understand how you can be good and allow suffering into my life. I don't understand how this can happen to me. That was where Naomi was at, and that is where many of us have been at in our lives before. And so Naomi and Ruth, in this account, both felt unseen and unheard at times. And that's why the title of this series is God Sees You, because God sees you as an individual, not just as a nation, not just as the church. He doesn't just love the church. He loves you personally. And so Naomi and Ruth both felt unseen and unheard. Naomi felt unseen and unheard by the Lord. She even felt that God was distant and even that God was against her. She says in chapter one, the Lord, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. See, she knew that everything came from the hand of the Lord. She recognized that. And so she felt unseen and unheard. And even like the Lord was against her. And Ruth also felt unseen and unheard. When they came back from Moab, when they came into the land of Israel, into Bethlehem, Naomi said in verse 21 of chapter 1, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Even though Ruth was standing right next to her, Naomi said, I came back with nothing. Telling Ruth in her mind that she's not seen. She's not being heard. Like these, this is how these ladies are feeling at this time. And yet the truth that will become even more clear as we move throughout the pages of this book is that there is a God who not only saw them and heard them, but divinely orchestrated all of the events of their lives in order to bring about a much greater good. All they needed to do was change their perspective. And so the truth is this. No matter what you have gone through or are currently going through, God sees you. God sees your every tear, he hears your every cry, and he is somehow and in some way using your life circumstances, even the trials of life, the pains that we all feel, he is using those to bring about a much greater good. And since you and I, who live as Christians in the year 2020, we can read the entire book, the book of Ruth, and we can see this testimony, we can see their lives played out, written out right here from chapter 1 to three and four. And since we have the bird's eye view, the question that we should all be asking in situations like this is not, does God see me, but do I see God? The question that we should be asking since we have the bird's eye view is not, does God see me, but do I see God? Do I see the way that he is working in this situation? I may not understand all of the details. I may not understand exactly what he is doing in every little thing. But I know from Scripture, from His Word, that He sees me. And He's working in my life for my good and for His glory. And so the way that we do this is not by only looking at our situations, but by fully looking at the Scriptures. Your life experiences do not define who you are. God's Word defines who you are. And His Word is above all words because His Word is truth. And so in chapter one, we see kind of a general reference for, for all of Israel, all the people of Israel. Then we see this ordinary family, Elimelech, Naomi, Malon, Kilion, Orpah, and Ruth, whenever they get to the land of Moab, the two sons marry Orpah and Ruth. And then in chapter two, we're introduced to a character named Boaz. But the question is, who is Boaz? And that's an interesting question because um, he has kind of a, a strange history as what we would think of as strange. So when Israel was in Egypt, God gave them the exodus. Like he led them through the Red Sea, parted the waters, they walked through, they went into the wilderness. God was on top of the mountain. He gave them the law. He gave them the covenant. He gave them everything. He said, you are my people. I am your God. I am giving you a land. And so whenever they were on the border of the river, Israel sent 12 spies into the land in order to go, just check it out. Just check it out and come back. Tell us what you see. And those 12 spies came back, and only two of them trusted the Lord. The other 10 persuaded the entire congregation of Israel. They persuaded the entire nation of Israel to turn their back on the Lord. We cannot defeat these people. They are bigger than us. They are mightier than us. They have much more powerful weapons than us. 
And yet, God chose to leave them in the wilderness for 40 years. And then at the end of the 40 years, 40 year wilderness journey, sent them into the promised land, raised up Joshua to lead the people. And he sent two spies into the promised land. And those two spies went and they actually stayed at a place uh, known as Rahab. They stayed at her house. And that has always bothered me that they were at a prostitute's house, but that's exactly where they are. And Rahab, while they were sitting there in the house, in the home, striking up conversation, whatever they were doing, I'm not sure. But somehow it became very evident that they were Israelites and that God was sending them in to take control of the city. And the authorities of the city also knew that. And so they came knocking at Rahab's door and Rahab hid them on her roof. And she lied to them, the authorities, and said they, they went that way. And so then she sent the people out of the city and they chased after the men. They never found them, obviously, because Rahab hid them. Anyway, the point is, that God saved Rahab because she saved them. And so when Israel came in and destroyed Jericho, Rahab and her family was saved from the slaughter. And so they became Israelites. And Rahab, the prostitute, became a believer. And she married a guy named Salmon. And this is what Matthew 1, 5 through 6 says. This is the genealogy of Christ that says, Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And so Boaz's mom was a, a prostitute, a former prostitute. And yet, here he is. The Bible actually presents him as a godly man living in an ungodly time. And yet he is single. He's an older man. He's single. He's never been married. And so he too would have reason to question, to wrestle with that question. Does God see me? And so let me pray, and then we will just jump right into Ruth chapter 2. Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you so much for who you are. God, that even when we don't understand what life brings our way, even when we don't understand what life throws at us, Lord, it's not by accident. You have a plan and a purpose. You have a reason for everything that happens. And God, we can trust you. Your word says we can trust you because you are faithful and you are unchanging. And so God, I pray that you would change our perspective. God, help us to know and to really believe, not just as information, but to really believe and take it to heart that you see us, that you love us, that you know us individually. You know our names. Even though there's 8 billion people in the world, God, you know me. You know each person here today and you love them, and you sent your son for them, to die for them, and to rise again on their behalf, so that they would be saved, and so that they could know you. God, I pray that you'd lead us through this passage, and that you would be glorified, that the name of Jesus would be magnified. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Now, since the video kind of led us through the passage, I'm not going to read it uh, just initially. Uh, so, We'll just use that as a basis. But right off the bat, so far in the book of Ruth, we have seen that these two ladies had two physical needs, basically two needs. They needed a family and they needed food. They needed a family because their husbands are, are dead. They passed away. There's two widows here who have no children, no prospects, no nothing. They, they need family. They are alone in the ancient world. And in the ancient world, you really needed in order to definitely thrive in the ancient world, you needed a man in their life, and they did not have a man in their life. It was just them. And so they were coming back to Israel, but they needed family, and they needed food. Obviously, there was a famine in the land. That's what drove them into the land of Moab. But now they're headed back to the nation of Israel. They're headed back to Bethlehem. They just entered Bethlehem, as it says at the end of chapter 1, and they need family and food. And right off the bat, again, at the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, we see that there is hope on the horizon. We see that God is doing something. Even in the midst of suffering, trial, pains, whatever it is, God has a, a ray of hope at the, end, at the end of the tunnel. It says this in chapter 1, verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, 
who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Like it just so happened that they just arrived just in time for the barley harvest, like right at the beginning. So there's a ray of hope for food, that they might be able to get some food. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, now Naomi had a relative. And so now we're introducing someone in the family. So we're seeing right at the beginning, right at the end of last chapter, right at the beginning of this chapter, how God is going to fulfill both of their needs. And that's what God does. He fulfills our needs. And so this is what it says, chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now this word worthy that described Boaz was a very broad term. It's really hard for translators to translate. Some of your Bibles might say wealthy. It's just because this word includes so much. It encapsulates uh, a lot of things. So basically this man was honorable. He was wealthy. He was influential. He was a man of high standing. Like this is a godly man that we're talking about. And he's contrasted with the world that he was living in. In chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the days when the judges ruled. This was a very dark time in Israel's history. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They went their own way. They did not seek the Lord. And yet right here we have a man who is worthy. He is a man of high standing. He is influential. He is wealthy. He is a godly man. Here is a man who stands in contrast to his culture, which brings up a great question for each one of us as we read this. Do our lives stand in contrast to the rest of the world? Are we a contrast, like night and day contrast to the rest of the world? Verse three, verse two says, and Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Now, what Ruth did here was pretty incredible of her. She's she's really exhibiting godliness here. Ruth sought her mother-in-law's permission to go out. She was not necessarily under the authority of her mother-in-law, Naomi, but she was willingly submitting herself under Naomi's authority. And she was respecting her and honoring her by asking permission. Like, let me go out. You went out. When we were in Moab, you went out, Naomi, into the field to provide for us. Let me, now that we're here, after this long journey, let me go out into the field and work all day in order to bring back food. That's what Ruth is doing. She was willing to work hard to provide she was willing to deliver Naomi from shame. Naomi didn't really want to be seen in public at this point. She didn't even want to be called Naomi. She wanted to kind of be on her own right now, and Ruth was willing to protect her from that. And number four, she wasn't too proud to admit that she needed help and that she was in poverty. You see, women, men, whoever it was, gleaning the way that she was gleaning, basically told the world, anybody who would see you, they need help. They're in poverty. They're poor. Like something is wrong. Something is not right. And so she was humble, though. She was willing to be looked at by other people. And so she wasn't too proud to admit that she needed help. And so here we see there's a godly man right at the beginning and a godly woman exhibiting godliness. We see that Ruth is already a godly woman from chapter one, what she said, to the, it's not just Naomi's God, this is my God. It's not just Naomi's people, this is my people. Ruth was identifying herself with the people of God and with God himself. And so this is kind of like a Hallmark film. You know, it's just by coincidence, they're just about to run into each other. And that is what's happening. However, in Leviticus 19, verses nine through 10, It says this, it's talking to landowners, people who had land, who grew crops. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest, and you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. In Deuteronomy 24, 19, it says, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. The Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. So Ruth had the right to do this. She had the right to go and glean and gather from any field she wanted to. And yet she asked 
her mother-in-law for permission to go. And then just coincidentally, as if chance would happen, just by luck of the draw, she happened to stumble upon Boaz's field. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, verse 4, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. And then now this is going to start their interaction. This is going to start their meeting. But let me first say that nothing happens by chance. Ruth did not just stumble or happen upon Boaz's field. She was guided there. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 says, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And everything that happens in our lives is done by the Lord. God is orchestrating all the events of our lives, good and bad. He's using them for our good and for his greater glory. So nothing is just accident. Nothing is just coincidence. And so as we see Ruth stumbling onto this field, now gleaning in this field, and then Boaz kind of coming on the scene, he comes up to his workers. He says, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Now you can learn a lot from people by the things that they say. In Acts chapter 19, when Paul was coming back to Ephesus, he met some of the disciples of John the Baptist, which was years before that. But he met them, and they started talking, and Paul instantly knew there was something was not right, something was wrong, something was off. And so he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they're like, no, we hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit um, coming down. So the point was that Paul knew by what they were saying, something was off. And the same is true today. Someone on Facebook, as you're scrolling down the newsfeed, could make one comment. It doesn't even matter really what it is. They can make one comment, and you can almost decipher their entire political portfolio on how they stand on every single issue, almost with 100% certainty. You can do that because it's very easy to decipher who people are, and you can learn a lot about people by the things that they say. And so the first thing that Boaz says is, the Lord be with you. And then his, his people, his workers say, the Lord bless you, meaning that this was probably a normal greeting. So this wasn't just kind of the first time, you know, the Lord bless you. Like, no, this was probably a normal thing. Boaz would come to his workers and say, the Lord be with you. This was the way he greeted them. They would say, the Lord bless you. And someone, though, caught his eye. Someone caught his attention as he was there in the field. He, he then says to the young man who was in charge of the reapers, verse 5, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. Like she's the one that everyone has been talking about. And she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until until now, except for a short rest. Basically, the servant said, she came early morning before you got here, Boaz. Like, she's been actually working all day. And yet she asked me, she, like, she came up and asked me if she could glean from this field, even though that was her right. According to the Old Testament law, that was her right to do that as a widow, as a sojourner. And yet what we see here is that Ruth even though she did not need to ask, the point that we see here is that she was not going to live her life with an attitude of entitlement. She was willing to put herself in submission under other people and to accept the lot that the Lord had for her. And so instead, she chose to honor and submit herself to others. And that type of character never goes unnoticed. And so what Ruth would end up learning through all this was not just that Boaz saw her, but the Lord saw her. The Lord was watching and the Lord was providing for her. And so what we're going to see here as we continue on is exactly what Ruth was going to learn. If people can see us, then certainly God can see us. And that's our first point. If people can see us, then certainly God can see us. If Boaz could do this, certainly the Lord could do this. So if people can see us, certainly God can see us. And point number two, if people can shield us, then certainly God can shield us. Verse 8 says this, Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Basically, Boaz said, stay in this field. If you stay in this field, you will be provided for, you will be protected 
However, Ruth knew that this type of kindness was obviously not normal. And this led her to say in verse 10, she fell on her face, she bowed to the ground, and she said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, that you should see me since I am a foreigner, like I am a stranger. I am not from here. I am a stranger. And so in Ruth's mind, it would be easy for her to fear being driven out of the land. For Boaz to come up to her and say, like, get off my property. You're not supposed to be here. That would be easy for her to reason out. Because in one sense, that's exactly what Israel was supposed to do. Whenever they came into the land originally, they were supposed to drive out all the other people groups for the purpose that they would not bow down to idols, that they would not fall into evil practices, and that they would not fall into the false religions that were already occupying the land. So they were supposed to drive out the inhabitants of the land, except here we see an example of Boaz saying, no, 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 stay in my land, stay here, and you will be provided for and you will be protected because Boaz had heard all about her. He had heard about how she had left behind the idols of Moab. She had left behind her family, her friends, everything that she knew in the past. She had left that behind. Like that is repentance and that is turning to faith in God. Like she left everything behind and turned to Yahweh and followed her mother-in-law. She was serving her and she was providing for her and she was protecting her. And that is why Boaz now says, you are not a foreigner. You are family. You are not a foreigner. You are family. And so Boaz answered her in verse 11, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And now you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now Boaz actually gave a prayer and a blessing for Ruth not even realizing that later on in the book, in the next chapter, and in chapter four, Boaz, just a few months later, would actually be the answer that the Lord gives. That God is going to use Boaz to provide for her. God is going to use Boaz to meet her needs of family and food. And so the wording here, though, is interesting. Verse 12, he says, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, Jesus, in the New Testament, the gospel accounts, likened himself to a mother hen. He said this in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Like That's what Jesus wanted to do. He wanted to be like a mother hen and gather all of his chicks underneath his wings. He wanted to protect them. And you can look up videos on, on YouTube and anything of, of hens actually protecting their chicks from rain and from, from vipers and, and cobras and whatever it is, danger. The point is that a mother hen protects her chicks, but those chicks have to run under her wings. And that is exactly what Ruth did. In Psalm 91, 1 through 4, the psalmist says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Now again, the the whole point that Boaz was making was that if you stay here, you will be protected and provided for. And this blew her mind that he would say all of these things. In verse 13, she says, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Like, I do not belong on this field. I'm not, I'm not normally on this field. I, I'm not under you in any way. I am a stranger. I'm a foreigner. I don't even belong to this land. And yet you have taken me in. You have sheltered me. You have shielded me. You've even told your men to protect me and to not touch me. Like that meant a lot to Ruth because she knew that she was seen, that someone was seeing her, someone was noticing her. And so what Ruth would learn as we continue, she would learn throughout all of this was not just that Boaz would be her shield, but the Lord would shield her. Because everything ultimately goes back to him. 
The reason that Boaz was there was because the Lord placed him there. The Lord gave him that land. The Lord gave him this family. The Lord put him in this position to be a shield for her. Thus, it all goes back to the Lord is the one who sees her. The Lord is the one who shields her. And so if people can shield us, certainly God can shield us. Number three, if people can serve us, then certainly God can serve us. Verse 14, and at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her the roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. And I want you to notice that Boaz did not shun her. Boaz served her. He included her in the mealtime. Like everything that they were doing, he included Ruth, this foreigner, this Moabite, someone that Israelites would normally look down on. Boaz was bringing in, like, you're not a foreigner, you're family. You're one of us. That's what he was implying. And so let's just say that this, none of this is what Ruth expected. She probably woke up that morning thinking, I'll ask permission from my mother-in-law. I'll go out. I'll try and find some land that I can that I can glean from, that I can gather some grain, and, and I hope to come back with maybe enough for dinner, maybe enough to, to fill my pockets, you know, and then I'll just have to do the same thing tomorrow, and every single day we'll be relying on whatever I can find on the ground, whatever is left behind, whatever is forgotten. That's probably what she thought. Instead, what she found is that Boaz was here as this redeemer individual, as this guy who came on the scene, this worthy, influential, wealthy man of high standing came on the scene in order to provide for her and to take care of her. And she actually had enough leftovers from this mealtime that she took back to Naomi. In verse 18, verse uh, the last part of verse 18, she also brought out and gave her, that's Naomi, what food she had left over after being satisfied. So she actually took some of the food that she was eating during mealtime and put it in her pockets and saved it for later, for when she got home. Like, she is full. She may have not thought that she was going to have a satisfying dinner that night, especially having to split whatever she was able to pocket during that day with Naomi, but she's satisfied. Like, she's probably not even hungry for dinner at this point because Boaz came into her life, saw her, took note of her, and provided for her. And Boaz then gave his men a reminder to let her gather from the harvest and also to treat her well. I do not touch her. Do not harm her. Do not rebuke her. Do not reproach her. He said in verse 15, when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Now, some people ask because they, they some people see a disconnect between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there's really not one, but some people try and make there to be one. And they say, where is grace in the Old Testament? And this is a perfect example of grace in the Old Testament. Boaz was only required by law to basically allow the outskirts to not be reaped, to not be harvested, so that poor people could come in, widows, orphans, like People who could not provide for themselves, they could come in and they could just get kind of what's left over. That was all that Boaz was required by law to do, the bare minimum so that the person would survive. And yet here he is taking care of her, satisfying her needs, fulfilling every need that she has, family and food, right off the top. That is what he is doing. That is grace in the Old Testament. He's showing generosity. He's going above and beyond the law. And so what Ruth would continue to learn throughout all of this was not just that Boaz would serve her, but the Lord would serve her. Because if people can serve us, then certainly God can serve us. And I'm not talking about God being like a butler to us. That would be the wrong visual to have. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve. You see, the early church recognized this. They understood that not only does God know us, but he knows our needs. God knows everything that you and I need. That is why Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow. God feeds the sparrows. He will feed you as well. Adam, when God made Adam in the Garden of Eden, Adam had a need. God made him with that need. And he said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper. God served Adam by bringing him Eve. Israel had a need for food when they were wandering the desert for 40 years. And God served Israel for 40 years with manna from heaven, six days a week. The wedding at Cana had a need for more wine. Jesus made more wine. 
many Israelites had a need to be healed from various illnesses. Jesus did exactly that. Any good thing, any blessing, and any sort of provision that comes into our lives is from the Lord. Again, who gave Boaz this land to be able to bless Ruth? It was the Lord. It all ultimately goes back to him. So he's the one who sees us, shields us, serves us, and God is the one who saves us. God alone is the one who saves us. If people can save us, then certainly God can save us. Verse 17, so she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. Now, just an FYI, an FY, it said in that video was um, like five gallons or so, but it was about 30 to 50 pounds of food. So for a lady who thought, I might get a couple pockets full of grain, Boaz gave her a big sack of 30 to 50 pounds of food for her, then to carry all the way back to her mother-in-law. Like, this is a woman right here. Like, she worked all day, would put probably me to shame. She worked all day out in the field, out in the hot sun, harvesting, reaping, like, gleaning, gathering grain, and now she's taking it back because this isn't just for her. This is also to serve her mother-in-law. And so she was carrying all this food back home. Naomi saw her off in the distance, and her jaw dropped. Like, no way. Where did you glean today? Where did you gather? Like, who took notice of you? Because she knew, even Naomi knew, this is not normal. This type of kindness, this type of generosity is not normal. And she says in verse 19, her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, this man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, besides, he said to me, you shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. Now, I want you to notice the first thing that Naomi does is offer kind of a blessing to Boaz. That's appropriate. But then the very next thing is she tries to play the matchmaker game because she starts to think, man, these two would be perfect for each other. Like, I don't even know when was the last time she actually saw Boaz, but, but when she hears that it's Boaz, she's like, he's a redeemer. He's a kinsman redeemer, which means that he's a blood relative. He is a, a type of savior as a redeemer. He's a, he's a basically a deliverer, someone who could restore the fortunes of another. Like he was allowed by Israelite law to then come in and continue the genealogical line. And Boaz is meant to be seen that way. He's meant to be seen as whoever wrote this was intending him to be seen as a deliverer. And so for us, as, as we look, he is a type of savior. So notice the parallels between him and the Lord Jesus. He is a worthy man, he was of the right clan, like he had the right birth. Boaz was born the right way, which is parallel to our Lord. He was born the right way. Number three, his name means strong. And from the New Testament, from the book of Colossians, we know that the very first time in the Bible Jesus is referenced is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus is right there in Genesis chapter 1, and the name for God is Elohim, which emphasizes God's strength. So Boaz's name means strong, and God's name in Genesis 1-1 is Elohim, emphasizing his strength. Number four, he came from Bethlehem. That's very significant later on. And number five, the blessing of his arrival is the Lord be with you, which is Jesus's presence. The very first time Jesus is referenced in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the angel says, according, according to the prophet Isaiah, his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so Boaz coming here saying, the Lord be with you. Jesus's presence is God with us. It is the Lord be with you. And so he's meant to be kind of a type of savior, a type of deliverer for Ruth in her situation. And verse 22 says, and Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her 
mother-in-law. And so that is exactly what she did. She obeyed her mother-in-law. She continued working. For the next few months, Naomi is probably thinking, the light bulb has probably gone off. Like, at first, my life was a wreck. At first, everything was falling apart. I lost my husband. I lost my sons. I'm, I'm kind of stuck with, with this Moabite foreigner. And yet, maybe this is how the Lord wants to provide. Maybe this is what the Lord is doing in my life. And so the light starts to click. And so what we see here is that God was providing for them both of their needs, family and food. God saw them, God shielded them, God served them, and God saved them. But chapter 2 was still just the beginning of the book of Ruth. And the point that I'm trying to make is this. All of these things were done by Boaz, who was just a man. He was a godly man, but he was just a man. And anyways, being godly means that you're like God. That is what godly means. You're being like God. So if you are one way and that is godly, then that means that God is the epitome of that. God is godlike. He is God. Thus, if Boaz, though, can do this stuff, then you and I can do this stuff. Other people can do this stuff. And this is the point, kind of with the outline, what I was going for. If people can do these things, limited sinful people can act this way and do these things, then certainly, obviously, definitely, God can do these things even more than we can. But this all comes with us living with perspective and knowing that you're known, believing the truth that God sees you, that God knows you. It's easy to say that God loves the world and the church, but it is a lot harder for us to admit and believe that God loves us personally. But I want you to think about this. There are people in your life, family, friends, they would do anything to serve you. They would do anything to take care of you. They would do anything to bless you. And there are other people in your life that you would do the same thing for them. Likewise, God will do that for his people. And this is kind of the, the big idea that I wanted to draw out. So this is what I want you to remember. There was a, there was a rhyme a few years ago anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. No, you can't. Yes, you can. Yeah. Anyway, so if you remember anything, remember this. Anything you can do, God can do better. God can do anything better than you. Just leave out the argument part, but anything you can do, God can do better. God can do anything better than you. So I hope you've seen that on the way home. Anything you can do, God can do better. God can do anything better than you because the obvious conclusions are if people can see us, certainly God can see us. If people can shield us, then certainly God can shield us. If people can serve us, certainly God can serve us. And if people can save us, certainly God can save us. Romans chapter 5 verses 7 through 8 says this, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. So Paul says that it might be possible, you might see situations in life when someone actually dies for somebody else, when they sacrifice their life for somebody else. But God one-ups them. God one-ups all of us. And it says, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Boaz, and, and we can save people from making bad decisions. We can save people from famine. We can save people from, from different things in this life. But none of us have the power to save somebody from eternal death. There's only one person who can do that, and that is our Lord and Savior. He has the power to one-up us. Because if we can do certain things, God can do it, and God can do it better. God can do anything better than you. And so we're going to take communion. But before we do, before I call up the worship team, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the communion passage. Then I'm going to call up the worship team. And then the way we're going to do communion is that from the back row, uh, if you just, each side, just come up, grab, grab the communion elements and then go around this side to the wall, and then go back to your seat, and then balcony, just kind of wait for the, the front row here or whatever, and then come down to do it. And just while you have it, at some point, while the music is playing, just take communion by yourself, take communion with your family, whoever you're with. This is what the Bible says. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're doing. We're reminded of the sacrifice that he gave. He gave his life on the cross for our sins. He died for us so that we could have life in God, so that we could have peace with God. And every time we take communion, we're also looking forward to the day when our Lord comes back to save us from everything else that we need to be saved from, from this world, from corruption, from our sin nature. And so this is why we take communion as believers. So I'm going to call the worship team to come up, and then again, just kind of as Rose.